Good morning, Bethel. I need more in the monitor, as much as you can give me. Good morning, Bethel. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. This is God's sanctuary. Praise God. Stand to your feet and look around and just wave. Come on, stand up just a little bit longer. Wave to somebody. Tell them you love them in Jesus' name. Amen. How exciting it is to be out here today. Remain standing for the reading of God's Word. We're not going to change much at all. And I'm just going to share with you what the Lord's put on my heart here today. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to invite you to open them with me to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 1. And we're going to begin at verse number 2 in a moment. You're going to recognize that immediately. We've been here for the last several weeks. And I just feel like we need to go back and share a couple of thoughts. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin with verse number 2. Before we hop into this just want to make uh, an announcement myself. Uh, Many of you are aware of the COVID crisis that is still continuing in uh, the country of India. Many of you have heard of the struggle that they're having getting oxygen tanks um, into remote villages, and they are really struggling. Well, there is a ministry within the Assemblies of God that is actually called Live Dead. And they are spread into some of the most difficult reached areas in our world. And they are um, in right now in India. They are looking for help um, from churches here around the world, but specifically here in the United States, to help them get those oxygen tanks in. And as a church, by the grace of God, we have already committed to $10,000 that we are going to send to this ministry. I'm thankful that we have that opportunity. But, you know, we met with the elders and the deacons this past week, and we just felt that rather than just writing a simple check for $10,000, that we would love to bring that to all of you. Because I know that some of you would say, hey, I would love to give to that project itself. And so next Sunday, everybody look at your neighbor and tell them, next Sunday, I want to say it loud, i got to hear it up here, okay? Next Sunday, we're going to have a big place here where we'll all bring our offering in, and we're already going to do the 10000 and then whatever else comes in, we'll give on top of that. So you bring another ten, we give 20 You give $5, we will give 15 but however it comes in. But I believe that we have been blessed as a nation to be a blessing to other nations for the glory and the honor of God. So next week, turn your neighbor say, next week, best offering. Bring it here, all right? We'll do that together. All right, we're going to read the Word of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse number 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power is given to us. How many things? All things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. 
For so in the entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a powerful word from our Father to us today. And I'd like to share with you a message within the series that we've kind of been working through entitled, um, Equipped and Escaped. But this one, I'm going to look at the blessings of living an overcoming life. How many of you believe that our God wants us to overcome in this life? Three of you. How many of you believe that God wants us to be overcomers in this hour? And Peter brings out two blessings that will always follow those who are committed to living an overcoming life. And Father, thank you for this beautiful day. I know it's a little warm, but I am thankful that it's not raining and that we're gathered together and in this open air sanctuary, we can loudly proclaim that there is still only one name given by which man may be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that throughout this morning, you alone would be glorified. Speak to our hearts, I ask, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord praise in this house one more time here this morning. Before you're seated, turn to your neighbor and tell him you love him. In Jesus' mighty name. Now listen, for those of you who have you know, just been joining us here recently, we have been talking about the promise of God that in Christ Jesus, His Son, we have not only escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust or through selfish, covetous living, but that we have been thoroughly equipped also by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of God that He supplies to live godly lives. Peter again says it this way, that God's divine power has given to us all things, say all things, He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, which just simply means that there is absolutely no excuse for living a defeated life. Because the same power that raised Christ from the dead that very first Easter morning, and how many of you know he rose from the dead on the third day, that same power is available to us so that we can live godly lives in Christ Jesus. And he is also, as if that was not enough, given us in his word exceedingly great and precious promises that through these promises and the things that pertain to life and godliness that have been provided by the divine power of the Holy Spirit, we might become partakers of the divine nature of God. And I'm going to tell you, I get excited every time I read that. That is mind-bending. That God has actually invited us to become partakers of His divine nature. Now that does not mean that we are gods. It doesn't mean that one day we will be gods. But how many of you know that we are created in God's image according to His likeness and by the Spirit of God that now dwells in every one of us, we can live a God-like life that we can reflect in this world that we live in the very nature and character of the living God Almighty, which was the very reason we were created in the first place. Not for our glory, but for the glory of Almighty God. Can I hear a good amen if you believe that today? And so we are partakers of the divine nature of God. So Peter says, knowing all of this, that we are now to give all diligence. And I want you to think about that for a moment. He says, I don't want you to be lazy. Knowing these promises and knowing this power, I want you to now give all diligence. How many of you know that God is not going to make you grow, nor is it His responsibility to make you grow? There are some of us that just think that God is going to zap us one day and take us to the next level. He says, no way. He says, I've provided you all the promises you need, and I've provided you all the power that you need, but now I want you to be diligent. I want you to go after me. I want you to grow. I want you to develop. I want you to give all diligence to exercise your faith. And what is our faith in? Our faith is in Almighty God, but specifically here, 
Paul or Peter says that our faith is to be in the promises of God and the power of God. We have to have faith that the promises of God are yea and amen and faith that all the power we need to do it is there so that we will be obedient. And exercising our faith, we add to it moral excellence. And then exercising moral excellence, we add to it knowledge. And then exercising our knowledge of God, we add self-control. And then exercising self-control, we, ex- we actually add perseverance and patience. And then exercising that perseverance, we add godliness. And then exercising godliness, we add to it um, brotherly kindness. And exercising brotherly kindness, we add to it love. And we talked about this the last time we were together, and that is that love is God. And everyone who knows God and is born of God loves because God is love. And so what Peter is basically outlined for every one of us is that if we are growing properly, we are becoming more like God every day. That every day we are conforming to the image of our Savior. How many of you are thankful that we have been invited into such an intimate relationship with God that we can be like Him in the earth in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give Him all the praise if you believe that. And so Peter says that if we do these things and we give ourselves to them consistently and continually, that we will never be unfruitful or barren in our knowledge of the Lord. In other words, if we will give ourselves to these things and develop them in our lives, that we will always have a deepening relationship and intimacy with the living God Almighty. But he says, if we lack these things, then we have forgotten who we are in Christ and that we have been cleansed from our old sins. Everyone here that professes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and whether you're saved or not, that is between you and the Lord. But everyone that at least professes to know Christ as their Lord and Savior is either fruitful or forgetful. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you're either fruitful or forgetful. There's no in-between. Every one of us who profess to know the Lord are either bearing fruit and becoming more like the Lord or we are forgetful. Specifically, we are forgetful of who we are in Christ and that we have been cleansed from our old sins. And I want to bear down into that a little bit more before we go any further here today. We talked a little bit about it the last time we were together. But I want you to understand the significance of not only being forgiven of our sin, but being cleansed from all of our unrighteousness. How many of you know we need forgiveness when we sin? Three of you. How many of you know we need forgiveness when we sin? Amen. And I'm thankful that that forgiveness is possible. But can I tell you what we are more in need of is a cleansing of our character. Remember that your character and my character was developed over time in a series of choices and decisions. And in our rebellion, we have actually bent our nature, bent our character towards sin. We have rebelled against God for so long that our nature is absolutely bent and twisted. And that's why we can maybe hold it together for a little while, but eventually we go back into those old habits because that nature is bent towards sin. I don't need to just be forgiven of my individual acts of sin. I need a radical transformation of my heart so that there is a new nature that is bent towards righteousness. And that's why Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago, not just so that I could be forgiven, but that I could be cleansed of that unrighteousness. I am no longer in possession of a corrupt nature, but I am in possession of a divine nature. The living God lives inside of me and He has caused me to overcome. Come on, can somebody give God the praise in this house this morning in Jesus' name. So we are partakers of this divine nature. Now, you know, there's some people, honestly, let's be truthful. There are some people that would immediately say, well, Pastor Kurt, don't you know that we have 
two natures. You know, that we have a divine nature and we have a sin nature. How many have ever heard that before? You know, that you've got two natures in you and that's popularized today. And maybe you heard that from some preacher in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but they are determined to tell you that you've got two natures, that you've got a divine nature and you have a sinful nature. And I'm going to tell you, if you read the word of the Lord, I don't know how you would arrive at that. This isn't Sybil Christianity. You don't have multiple personality syndrome. You are either a child of God or you are in this world. You don't have a duplicity within you. In fact, the Bible says do not be double-minded. We are to be single-minded. You are one person. I mean, listen to what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians and chapter number 6. He says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what significance of that is there? Well, in the second letter that he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 6 and verse 14, he says this, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? If I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, how can I have dwelling in that at the same time darkness and evil. I'm going to tell you folks, when we sin, it's not because there is an evil nature in us. It is because we make a choice to sin. But I don't have to sin because greater is he that is living in me than he that is in this world. I am the temple of the Holy Ghost and I've got to always remember I've been cleansed from my old sin to live for the glory and the honor of Almighty God. Come on somebody, give him the praise if you believe that today. Now, again, Peter says that there are no less, and I would never say that there are not more, but Peter hones in on two blessings that flow from an overcoming life. Two blessings that you can live in every day of your life. The first one is given to us in verse 10. Listen to it again. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call an election sure For if you do these things, listen to the word of the Lord, you will never stumble. You will never stumble. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you will never stumble. That is not Pastor Kurt's word. That wouldn't even be Peter's word because Peter was being inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God. If we are diligent in doing these things, we will never stumble. That's the first blessing. How many of you are thankful that God has provided a way for you to live your life in such a way that you will never stumble again? Uh, Some of you are looking at me like, Pastor Kurt, you are crazy. We stumble all the time. Yes, you do. But that's not because you have to. Can I hear a better amen? You don't have to stumble because, again, greater is the Spirit of God living in you than the Spirit of the enemy that is in this world. He says, if you do these things, you will never stumble. And we can do everything we want to try and minimize the power of that word. But I wish that we would just leave the word of God alone and believe that if God said it, it is possible. We may stumble, but I don't have to because of the grace of God that abides within me in Jesus name now that first word again he says therefore so he is looking back at everything that we've already discussed and so he's basically saying seeing all these things that God has made for us seeing that we have divine power seeing that we have exceedingly great and precious promises from the father who cannot lie and has all the power necessary to keep his promises seeing that we have escaped the corruption of this world and have become partakers of his divine nature seeing that if we apply all these things to our lives we will be fruitful and if we don't we'll be forgetful he says therefore let us be even more diligent more mindful, more energetic, more passionate to secure our call and our election. Now there again is that little bit of tension. Because it almost sounds like what Paul is saying is that we're saved by our works. 
that we are saved by our diligence. That it's our responsibility to be diligent so that our election and our call into the kingdom of God is forever secure. But can I say it again? We're not saved by works. We are saved by the grace of God. How many of you are thankful for that today? We are saved by the grace of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What Peter is saying, and there's no other way around this, please understand. He's saying that if you are saved, you will be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Because that old nature is passed away. If you're truly saved, you'll hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you are truly saved, you'll be passionate about developing your relationship with Almighty God and growing in your faith if you are truly saved. If you're not and if you once were, but you're growing cold and you really aren't concerned about developing your relationship with God, I don't mind telling you, you're in trouble. You are in a bad place. If there is no thirst and hunger in your heart for righteousness, if there's no passion to be more like the Father, then there is something tremendously wrong with your faith. And I would caution you of how long you stay in that state. And now, listen, I'm not interested in any argument. I'm not here to debate whether you were saved and you fell away or you were never saved in the first place. I'll let the scholars debate that. I'm just going to tell you this. If you are truly saved, you will want to grow. If you're truly saved, you're going to want to be like your Father in heaven. If you're truly saved, there's going to be a desire to want to grow grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can I hear a good amen if you believe that today? I'm tired of the Christianity that we have in this country that tells men and women that all it is is getting into heaven. It's more than getting into heaven. If that was all it was, he would have taken you the moment you got saved. He left you and I here to make a difference in this corrupt world in Jesus' mighty name. And we can't do it by might nor power, but we can do it by the Spirit of Almighty God. Can I hear a good amen if you believe that today? Listen, don't ever take your salvation for granted. Don't ever become lazy. Don't ever become complacent in your walk with the Lord. Because Peter says, if we do these things, we will never stumble. And I looked up never in the Greek language. And you know what the Greek word for never means? Never, exactly. There's nothing special about it. He's saying God has provided a means by which we will never stumble. Now he doesn't say we won't stumble. But he's just saying you don't have to stumble. In fact, you know there were times when I would not say that because I was afraid of the backlash. But I'm just too old and stubborn now. I don't care what you come and tell me. I'm going to stay with the word of God. We don't have to sin. Come on, say that with me. We don't have to sin. Say it loud. We don't have to sin. There's nothing in the Bible that says that you're going to. And people say, well, we're just human. Well, yes, we are. But that's why God gave us His Holy Spirit. So that we could be holy. So that we could live overcoming lives. And I don't want to be the pastor that stands here and tells you, well, you're going to probably sin and fail and fall. And you're going to make a mess of all your relationships and your marriage. And you're going to hurt people. I'd rather stand before you and tell you, you don't have to live another day in bondage to sin because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead raises us from dead works to live for the glory of God. Come on somebody say amen to that if you believe it. Now some of you are thinking well that's just a random verse in the Bible. No, actually if you study the word of the Lord you will quickly discover that that is a theme throughout the entire New Testament. Listen to what Paul said. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 12 therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Now why would he command me not to let sin reign in my mortal body if it was impossible to not let it reign? Of course it was possible. He says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of unrighteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. 
For you are not under law, but under grace. I love those words. Now, it was interesting because I was thinking the other day as I was going over these, these scriptures that it's sad how 2,000 years has caused us to twist Paul's words. Because Paul's understanding of grace was that it was given to us so that sin would no longer have dominion over us, but we would have dominion over it. But today, we've turned grace around and said, you know, don't worry about how you live. Don't worry about how you treat one another. You're not saved by your works. You're saved by grace. And it's terrible how we have twisted and perverted it. That was never Paul's thought. Paul said, no, the grace of God was poured out not so that you could have a license to sin. He said grace was poured out so that sin would no longer have dominion over you, but you would put it under your feet and live victoriously in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, somebody shout amen if you believe that. Listen to, listen to what uh, John said in 1 John 3 in verse number 7. He says, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil is sin from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his, God's seed, remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now, I need to clarify something. He is not telling us that if we are saved, we're never going to stumble or we're never going to sin. i, I got to make that clear because I don't want you thinking that every time you stumble, you're not saved anymore. I don't believe that either. If you study this out, it's clear that he's talking about a lifestyle of living habitual in sin. And John says, no one who is born of God can habitually sin and have a lifestyle of sin any longer. He says that's impossible. And he says the reason it's impossible is because as being born of God, the seed of God remains in him, making it impossible for him to sin. What does that mean? Well, what is in seed? Seed carries the DNA of that nature that it comes from. And that seed has that. And what he's saying is, when you're born of God, His seed comes into you and it reproduces the very character of God. God cannot sin. So those who are born of God cannot sin endlessly because again, God lives in them in Jesus' mighty name. Can I hear a good amen if you believe that? Folks, I want you to get this down in your heart because there's some of you even now, you're bound and you're addicted and you're chained to something and you just think, I can't get out of this. I can't stop it. You may not be able to, but I want to tell you that 2,000 years ago, a Savior died upon the cross to free you from sin so you don't have to live in it any longer. In Jesus' mighty name. This is why Jude said, Now to him who is able to keep you from sin, stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I'm wondering if there's somebody that would lift up their hands and with your voice rejoice with great joy for a God who sets you free in Jesus name. Come on, fill this field with the praises of God who is greater in Jesus mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, someone someone once wisely said that the gospel is is a person we welcome, it is a truth to be believed, and it is a life to be lived. I love that. The gospel is a person to be welcomed, a truth to be believed, and a life to be lived. And folks, if any one of those three is missing, true biblical salvation is impossible. Today there are people who want to welcome the person of Christ, but do not want to live his life. That is not salvation. There are people who believe all the right things, but they don't welcome the person, Jesus Christ, or want to live for him. Folks, to be saved, you have to not only welcome the person, Jesus, into your heart. You not only have to believe his truth, 
but you have to live his life in Jesus' mighty name. Can I hear a good amen if you believe that? All right. Now, there's one more blessing. We're almost done. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. Listen. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, this is the second blessing that awaits all who live an overcoming life. Entrance into the eternal kingdom of God will be abundantly supplied. How many of you are thankful that you don't have to worry about where you're going after you die if you live an overcoming life? Amen. God has supplied an abundant entrance to anyone who lives an overcoming life in Jesus' name. Now again, you can hear that tension. It almost sounds like it is through our effort that an entrance into the everlasting of the kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is made. It's very easy to think that, but that's not what he's saying again. He's just simply saying that if you are genuinely saved, that you will be diligent and God will abundantly open up the gates of heaven and welcome you in one day in Jesus' name. Please understand, Peter is not saying that we do any of these things in order to be accepted by the Father. He says you'll do these things because you are accepted by the Father. And there is now a desire within you to want to please your Father in heaven for all that He has done. He is telling us that we can be assured of our salvation. I'm thankful that we don't have to walk through this life wondering where we're going to go when we pass. But we can be assured of our salvation. How many of you are thankful for that in Jesus' name? We can be assured that there is an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we are assured because we can see the progress of our life, and it is evident. You see, we don't like this, especially in this climate that we're in today. And I'm not talking about this climate. I'm talking about the spiritual climate. We don't like this, but what he is telling us is that, again, the evidence that you are genuinely saved is that you are progressing and you're becoming more like Jesus Christ. And that is something that all of us have got to understand. You know, a lot of people, they just simply think that the evidence of salvation is I can point to the moment when I ask Jesus into my heart. Like if I were to come to you and I was to say, you know, how do you know you're saved? You would, some of you might just say, well, I know when I was 5 or I was 15 or I was 25 or 35 or 55 or 75 that I came to an altar. I went to a crusade. I knelt by my bed. I prayed with my grandmother and I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And look, I have a little Gideon's Bible and they wrote in it that this was the day that I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. To which I would reply, that's great. I'm glad. That's a great starting point. What's happened in your life since? I want to know what's been happening since that day. Because there's more to salvation than just responding to an altar call. It's growing. So I would follow up and say, how's your prayer life? You know, do you look forward to praying every day? Do you carve out time every day to spend with the Lord? And if I were to listen to your prayers... How would your prayers sound? Would they be filled with your wish list? Or would I hear you praying for God to give you His kingdom and for an understanding of His will, knowing it's not about you, but it's all about His glory and His honor? Well, you're getting quiet now. I, I, I wonder, do you read the Word of God every day? Do you hunger for the Word of the Lord? Do you, do you spend time meditating on the Word? Do you journal what you feel the Lord is speaking to you through His Word? When was the last time that you sensed the presence of God dealing with your heart and with your life? You know, I would, I would say, if I were to follow you for one day, what would I hear you say to your wife, to your husband? 
How would you treat your son, your daughter, the people you work with? Could I, could I look at how you treat your enemies and could I see you handling them the same way that Christ would handle his? I want to know, are you becoming more like Christ? What about your church attendance? Can I, can I ask you, you know, this morning when you got up out of bed where you're just like, I can't wait to get into the house of God or did you complain the whole way in because you knew you're going to be sitting in the sun in 94 degree weather? You know what I'm saying? It's just like, where, where is your heart? You know, do you, do you look forward to Sunday? Do you guard it with all your heart? Or do you plan parties on Sunday and go to parties because in your mind you think it's just another day. It isn't just another day. This is the day of the Lord. And we're to gather together in Jesus' name. My Bible tells me that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but to exhort one another. And even more so, as we see the day of the Lord approaching, there should be a growing hunger to be in the house of the Lord God Almighty. I'm going to tell you folks, we've got to understand that we are living on the brink of judgment and we need to go into eternity with a full assurance, I know I'm ready because I'm not where I, where I need to be, but I'm not where I used to be. By His grace, every day I'm growing in Jesus' name. Come on somebody give God the praise if you believe it listen th this this was an issue even in Paul's day listen to what Paul said this isn't Pastor Kerr this is what Paul said to the Corinthian church he says do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God do not be deceived so evidently this was going on in the Corinthian church he says don't be deceived neither fornicator I guess i got to spell that out. I know we got kids. Parents, I'll leave it to you how you're going to unfold this. But fornication is sex outside of marriage. Thank you for that overwhelming, resounding amen. He says, do, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You know what Paul was saying? He's saying, I'm glad that you tell me you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. But he says, don't be deceived. You can say you've accepted Christ, but if you are a fornicator, you're not going to heaven. Can I hear a good amen? He says, if you're living with someone and you're not married, if you are hooking up, I'm trying to think of words to say with little kids here, if, if you're living together, if you're, yeah, hooking up, if you're getting busy and you're not, <laughs> and you are not married, you're not going to heaven. You're not going to the kingdom of God. If there is anyone or anything more important to you than God, you're not going to heaven. If you're a homosexual, if you're a sodomite, if you commit adultery, Jesus said, if you lust in your heart, you commit adultery. You're not going to heaven. If you're a thief, you say, I haven't stolen anything, but there's many ways to steal you can steal someone's reputation. You can steal someone's idea. Some of you think nothing of stealing somebody else's joy on a daily basis. There are many ways to be a thief. And he says if you're a thief and you're always thinking of yourself, you're not entering into the kingdom of heaven. If you're a covetous, drunkard, a reviler, an extortioner, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that sounds bleak, but this is what he goes on to say. And such were some of you. He says, listen, he saves us, but he says, you were that way, not anymore. Because now you've been washed in the blood of Christ. You've been sanctified and you have been justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of Almighty God. He's saying to us that there's got to be a transformation. I've got to be more like God and die to myself every day in Jesus' name. 
I want to be clear on this. Can those who practice these things be saved? Of course they can. And that's why he says, such were some of you, but now you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Of course, people that are in this, we all came out of it. We all read this list and we can see how we were all of these things. We can be saved, provided that we confess that these are sins. And we confess that we've sinned against a holy God. And that we forsake that sin and we submit the rest of our lives to His glory and to His honor. But don't ever, I don't care who tells you, don't ever, ever let anyone tell you that you can live the way you want to live and still enter into the kingdom of heaven. To live for Christ is to die to yourself and live for His glory alone. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Give Him all the praise. Um, my pianist, you can come up. We're almost done. As I was just thinking about this the other day, I thought, you know, the scripture's pretty clear that as I see it, there are three ways, maybe three conditions would be the better way, three conditions in which we will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not three ways into heaven. There's only one name given by which man may be saved. But as I see it in scripture, there are three conditions that we can enter into the kingdom of heaven in. The first one is that there will be those who are barely or scarcely saved. Listen, Peter said in 1 Peter 4 and verse 18, now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Peter said, look, make no mistake about it. There are going to be some people that get into the kingdom of God by the skin of their teeth. Now, he doesn't tell us who these individuals are. And I need to be very careful because I don't want to give anyone some false hope or false sense of security. But I have been around some people who just struggled with their walk with God. And, and you know, just... They kept fighting, but they would stumble, but then they'd come back and, and they would really live for him and then they would stumble back and they've really struggled with their walk. But it seems to indicate us that, that at that moment they were right with God and the Lord brought them in by the grace of God. He says there'll be, there'll be people like that, scarcely saved, but they'll make it. Then there are those who will be saved through fire. Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, I don't want to get into this, but he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ that all believers are going to stand before God at and give an account of their life. Okay, like some people think, eh, I just can't wait to get to the streets of gold. Well, before you get to those streets of gold, you're going to stand before God. And you're going to give an account for your life. And all of our works are going to be tried by the, the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And only what was done for the Lord is going to last. And Paul said that there's going to be some that when the fire is done, there's going to be nothing there. They didn't do anything for the Lord, but they're still going to be saved. Now to me... And again, i got to be careful. But to me, those are individuals that probably came to the Lord right at the very end. That made a bedside call out to the Lord. And were saved and didn't have their life to live for the glory of the Lord. But by the grace of God, again, they're welcomed in. Now, before I talk about the third one, let me just stop here for a moment. Because I know there's someone here or someone that's watching here that's thinking, well, that's good enough for me. And you're just thinking, you know, that's all I want. I just want to get to heaven. I don't care about growing in the Lord. I don't care about bearing fruit. I just want to get to heaven. I just want enough Jesus that I can go to heaven one day and not go to hell. Can I tell you as a pastor, I feel compelled to say this. You might want to rethink that strategy. Because I don't know if that's going to serve you well. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit inspired Peter and Paul to write these scriptures to tell us it's okay to be a lazy believer. I think what he was showing us is the incredible grace of God that there will be people who died in ignorance and God is still going to make a way for them. 
But I'm going to tell you, there is a reason that Peter used words like the righteous are barely saved. To be even more diligent to secure your call and election. And it wasn't to tell you you could just coast and skate into eternity. It was to say that the violent take it by force. That every day you've got to be determined to go all the way with Jesus Christ, folks. And if your mindset is, I just want to get by, you probably won't make it. The ones who are going to make it are those who kept fighting the good fight of faith. And even when they didn't understand, and even when things got tough, they said, I'm going to hold on to my God, and I'm going to press through it in Jesus' mighty name. Can I hear a good amen? I wouldn't want to go into eternity that way. But there is a third way, and that's victoriously. And it's what he said here. He says, for so an entrance will be supplied to, an, uh, to you abundantly into our everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here he's talking about God just flinging wide the open doors to those who are diligent. You know, you don't have to wonder. You can be diligent in the things of God and know that he's going to open wide the gates of heaven and welcome you in and say, well done, my good and faithful servant in Jesus' mighty name it is possible that Peter had in mind a Roman conqueror who would return to his city after a battle and he'd be welcomed by singers and musicians who would join him in a triumphant celebration of the victory that they had won and I am looking forward to that day when we can walk in having fought the good fight of faith in Jesus mighty name I don't know about anybody else but I don't want to just barely get in and I certainly don't want to go in having done nothing for the Lord I want to go in knowing I have left everything on the field, that I redeemed the time that I seized up every moment so that I could make a difference for the kingdom of God because I know that when I see Him it will be worth it all in Jesus mighty name. If that's your cry, stand to your feet right there and say Lord I commit my life to you today in Jesus name come on lift up your hands, lift up your voices, say I'm going all the way in Jesus mighty name hallelujah hallelujah Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless your name, bless your name. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one is looking around. And just for the ease of this, I'm going to ask you just to put your hands down as well. Because today I can't preach this message without asking if there is someone here that has never received Christ as their Lord and Savior. And today you feel the Lord piercing your heart and you know that today you need to surrender your life to the Lord listen we're all sinners we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God the Ten Commandments make that very clear even as we walk through Paul's list we know that we have sinned and there is absolutely nothing that we can do to make it right but I am thankful that Jesus came in to make it right he offered his life on a cross as an innocent man bearing our sin and he satisfied the justice of God in his death so that if we will humble ourselves and come before the Father and not only confess our sin but forsake it and surrender our life to him he will be faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and like I said you can leave this field today not only knowing you've been forgiven of your sin but you can leave this field today freed from sin never to go back to it again because greater now will be the one in you than this one that is in the world influencing your wicked heart you can do that today and so his heads are bowed and eyes are closed And no one is looking around. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. You can stop today and become a new man in Christ. A new woman in Christ. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one looking around. If you're here today and you need Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you just to raise up your hand boldly and say, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. Raise it up nice and high. I see some hands. I I think some of you are rededicating your life to the Lord. And you can do that right there in Jesus' name. And you can find any of us, even if you didn't raise your hand, you can come to us 
talk to us. But folks, we need to get busy. Christ is coming soon. And we have loved ones and family members that need Christ. We've got to be bold. The world is bold to declare its sin. Let us be bold to declare righteousness in Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Father, we thank you for our time together. And I pray for those that raise their hand to recommit. Because again, Lord, I know the ones that raise their hand. And I know that they're here to recommit. And I pray that today would be a new day, a new start in their walk with the Lord. But for the rest of us, Father, I pray that we would no longer be lazy, that we would no longer be complacent, but we would be diligent, as Peter put it. Lord, to add to our faith these things, to grow in the Lord, and to know that we have secured our call and our election and that we know that we are going to be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven not because of our works but because our works demonstrate that we are truly saved and born again. I pray, Lord, especially for any believer here that has been struggling with a debilitating sin that they would remember the words that have been spoken here today that they do not have to sin any longer. That you have given us the promises of God and the power of God that we can become partakers of the divine nature and as we grow in these things, sin will come off in Jesus' name. Father, I I just think to myself of how your word says they will never stumble and there is a reason for that because as we go through that list, we recognize that if we are diligent in building these things, we'll be so busy doing the things we should be doing that we've got no time to do the things we shouldn't be doing. And I pray that we would remember that. Some of us, we have too much time in our hands and that's why we're messing up. We need to be about our Father's business, growing in the things of God. And if we're diligent in them, we will never stumble. We'll overcome. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. Lift your hands one more time to the Lord here. Lift them up. Come on, give him a shout of praise here this morning. Just fill this field one last time with his praises. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Father, be glorified throughout this day, I ask, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. Go grab some water ice before you leave. Have a great day.